creating this museum gives us a chance to make manifest the dreams of many generations. We call the lost dream back. This is a milestone moment, not only for the Smithsonian, but for the United States. The goal of the museum is to make America better, provide opportunities for us to be made better by the past, and for us to move towards a future where race will always matter. They will find that those ideals are only met through sacrifice and struggle and a belief in a better day. This place is more than a building. It is a dream come true. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. And by knowing this other story, we better understand ourselves and each other. I, too, am American. I do want to give a shout out to Lonnie. It's really important to understand this project would not and could not have happened without his drive, his energy, and his optimism. 11 years we have dreamed, prayed, toiled for this day. Today, a dream too long deferred is a dream no longer. We've guaranteed that as long as there's an America, this museum will educate, engage, and ensure a fuller story of our country will be told on the National Mall. Welcome home. In May, the Smithsonian named its newest secretary, Lonnie Bunch III. What I hope is that I can help the whole Smithsonian be the place that people look to, not just to visit, but for answers to help them live their lives. So for me, it's about helping the Smithsonian be the place that is the glue for America and that helps America grapple with who it is, help us understand itself and its world. and LSU Harris Lecture Series, sponsored by the Martin Luther King Freedom Center under the leadership of Dr. Roy Wilson and Dr. Karen Bolton. Since 2011, we've been presenting a series of outstanding speakers on the history, perhaps the future, of our civil endeavors. Civic engagement is the focus, bringing young people and our entire community into the sense of how we are going to make our nation what it ought to be. That is not only a difficult task, but one that requires all of our involvement and engagement. Tonight, we will have a lecture that I believe is going to be unique. It really is going to talk about not only the history of our nation, but to help us to understand how we take that history and mold it into a future that all of us can be proud of. The Martin Luther King Freedom uh, Center has been working to make sure that young people understand their responsibility and their potential as leaders to change in our community. 
lecture is sponsored by a number of corporate individuals and groups who really are committed to understanding of our history and our future. Tonight, I'm happy to introduce to you Dr. Ronald Copeland, the Senior Vice President of Kaiser Permanente for Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity. In his capacity, Dr. Copeland leads Kaiser's efforts to make sure that Kaiser is the forefront of inclusion and diversity as a national healthcare leader. As one of the leading HMOs in the country, Kaiser really wants to make sure that it really does put its words and its, and its efforts into action. Dr. Copeland is a graduate of Dartmouth University, as well as the University of Cincinnati Medical School. He is an expert uh, in surgery, but more importantly, he is committed to healthcare and its delivery to everyone, regardless of their circumstance, regardless of their ethnicity or their culture. That's what Kaiser is about. We thank him for his service and welcome him to the lecture series. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Ronald Copeland, Senior Vice President and Chief Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity Officer for Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente has been a longstanding sponsor of the Barbara Lee and Elihu Harris Lecture Series in partnership with the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center and Peralta Community College District. We remained a proud sponsor of this lecture series because of its important contributions to our history and community by showcasing leadership, culture, and creative solutions to some of the most complex issues facing our communities. Tonight's lecture features Secretary Lonnie Bunch, who many of you may know as the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the first African American to serve as secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Since its opening in 2016, this museum has provided over 6 million visitors from a variety of cultures with an impactful learning journey through the lens of the African American experience and its influence on American and world history. In addition to sponsoring this Barbara Lee and Elihu Harris lecture series, Kaiser Permanente is also a founding donor of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and the title sponsor of the museum's Sweet Home Cafe, which celebrates traditional African-American cuisine that also supports Kaiser Permanente's commitment to healthy living. Our sponsorships of this lecture series and the Smithsonian Museum are aligned with Kaiser Permanente's ongoing commitment to equity, inclusion, and diversity, which are inextricably linked to our mission and part of everything we do. We are proud to champion efforts to elevate the contributions, traditions, and perspectives of diverse cultures, as this supports our dedication to improving the health and well-being of our communities. Kaiser Permanente admires Secretary Bunch's leadership as an educator and historian and his lifetime commitment in service to the historical and cultural community. We also value his ongoing partnership in our continuous efforts toward achieving equity and inclusion for all. I, like you, look forward to tonight's lecture, and I hope it leaves you better informed, inspired, and compelled to act. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. You know, there's often been said that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. For many, the history of this country began in 1492 when Columbus came to the West Indies. For me, it began in 1619, when the first enslaved Africans landed at Jamestown. But you know, for me, this country has been a dichotomy. Uh, it has been a difficult challenge to try to put all the pieces together, given the American dream of justice and equality and the reality of racism and economic oppression. When you understand this country has great ideals, but it has often been founded on principles that are inconsistent with its reality. For example, is this a country of free enterprise or is this a country that is built on the backs of slaves and immigrants? Is this a country that really talks about freedom of speech or is this a country that imprisons those who in fact are willing to protest the inequities? We've seen throughout the history of this country, particularly as it relates to African-Americans, that those who have spoken up for freedom have been dealt with harshly. Whether it was 
Denmark Vesey and Nat Turner in the early 1800s, or the conductor of the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman. We saw what happened with Dred Scott. In the 1850s, the US Supreme Court said that no black man has a right to white men are bound to respect. We saw the dichotomy again with the Civil War when states seceded from this union over the issue of slavery. And then the proclamation that was issued by Abraham Lincoln that called for the emancipation of those held in bondage. We also saw dreams being put forth when we had the whole idea of reparations, 40 acres and a mule, reconstruction, only to be dashed by the 1877 decision where the federal troops were pulled out and the Hayes-Tillman Compromise was put into place. We had Supreme Court decisions such as that in Plessy versus Ferguson, where we said separate was equal. We didn't need to have an integration or full equality. Then we saw World War I. When the soldiers came back from World War I, they had the whole idea that they could have the same kind of freedom that they'd fought for in Europe. Only to see in 1919 the Elaine Massacre, where Black soldiers and others telling farmers who were trying to unionize were massacred, not only by the white farmers, but by federal troops as well. So we go through a history that is full of these kinds of contradictions. The same thing happened in the 50s when we began the civil rights effort. We had all kinds of hopes and, and possibilities. Then we saw the slaying of Emmett Till, followed by the Brown versus Board of Education decision that said, oh, we're going to have full equality in education in this country, and separate was not equal. The civil rights effort that followed that with Martin Luther King and the Montgomery bus boycott also gave us a sense of possibility and a revolution was possible. But then we saw the slaves of everyone from Medgar Evers to the four young women in the Birmingham school. We saw all the kind of things that made us think, hey, we're not going to be able to make it because people are going to protest. Racism will again uh, ring the day and determine uh, the future course of this country. We often see that these kind of challenges are not simply moments in time, but ongoing patterns through history. When Barack Obama was elected, many people proclaimed a new and post-racial America. But now we have a new problem, not just the president who has been the essence of racism and misogyny and uh, anti-gay, everything you could think of that we thought we were past, he has brought back to the forefront with a strong following of Americans who believe as he does, that these are the principles that they want to espouse. I would tell you today as we listen to Secretary Bunch, we understand the Smithsonian Institution is an institution that hopes and prays for the future of an America that will be inclusive. But it also reminds us of our history, a history that we have to overcome. And as we ask the question that we've been asking throughout this lecture series, Dr. Bunch will attempt to answer, where do we go from here, chaos or community? It is my pleasure to introduce the co-founder of the Martin Luther King Freedom Center and the co-namee, if you will, of this lecture series, our Honorable Congresswoman Barbara Lee. I've known Barbara since we were in college together. She has been the same person fighting for human rights, for justice and equality throughout her life. In her past 30 years as a member of the California Assembly, as a member of the California Senate, and now as a member of Congress for the past 22 years, she continues to fight for human rights, civil rights, full equality for women. She fought against AIDS. She fights for everything that's going to improve the quality of life and define the essence of our humanity and the America that we all dream and hope for, as opposed to the reality of what it is. We fight for what it can be. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community. Let's listen and learn. 
Thank you, Elihu, for those kind words of introduction. And special thanks also to all of our sponsors who support the Barbara Lee and Elihu Harris Lecture Series. We could not do this work without you. Elihu and I inaugurated this lecture series in 2011. The lectures are a joint project of the Peralta Community College District and the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. Our young people at the Freedom Center, they are working so hard on making sure we are all getting counted in the census and assuring voter participation and learning what it really takes to keep our democracy strong in these times. I want to congratulate and thank our young people because they are not only the leaders of the future, they are leading today. And I am so proud of you. And thank you to all of you who have joined us here for this timely, important lecture this evening. Many of you have come to numerous lectures over the years, and we are profoundly grateful to all of you for your dedication and support for these very important community dialogues. We are so proud and truly humbled to have Lonnie Bunch III with us tonight. Secretary Bunch, his work showcases the strength and creativity it takes to not only uncover the human heart and breadth of what has happened throughout our past, but Lonnie, I just have to say your career, it also shows the need for great courage, grit, and diplomacy in order to tell the real story. History is the storybook or the map of a people's path. History shows the places and the faces where a people were and what they were doing that got us to the here and now. Clearly, not all who tell stories are telling history. The craft and profession of history telling can be hijacked like anything else that belongs to the people. Lonnie Bunch has devoted decades of making certain the people's truth has been told through museums around the nation. At the end of the day, history, mind you, history is one of the essential elements of a healthy people and yes, a democratic society. It is fought over in many ways, fought like other essential elements that are fought over, such as healthcare, education, and human rights. It is important because the only way to know who we are, where we are, and where we go from here is to know history. Lonnie Bunch knows the truth is redemptive. As the founding director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, he assembled a group of dedicated nonconformists, and he created a living monument that offers healing and understanding of the nation's tortured, and I mean the nation's tortured, racial past. The task of creating the museum itself was an historical battle. It took unnerving, calm scholarship so that all the exhibits and details met the standard of reality. It took unleashed audacity to raise over $500 million for construction. It took incredible architecture and engineering skills to construct a great structure on the Capitol Mall that sits on former tidelands. It took the diplomacy of great statesmanship to gather support from three presidents and congressional members from both parties. And yes, it took blunt and simple presentations to get competing corporate leaders to join the common effort. And it took the wisdom and craftiness of a street organizer to overcome roadblocks and mean-spirited obstacles and to convert those challenges into great successes. And yes, as a member of the House Appropriations Committee, I had the privilege to work with Lonnie through many of these struggles, and I saw how he just kept going and rose to the occasion. Thank you, Lonnie Bunch. 
Curators protect and guard the spirit of the people. They not only tell the story of what we want to hear and what we want to remember, they also tell the story of what we don't want to remember. Lonnie G. Bunch III is the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian. As Secretary, he oversees 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, numerous research centers, and several education units and centers. Lonnie served as Chief Curator and Founder of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. When he started as director in 2005, he had one staff member, no collections, no funding, and no site for a museum. I remember those days very clearly. Driven by determination to build a place that would make America better, Bunch transformed a vision into a bold reality. The museum has welcomed more than 6 million visitors since it opened in 2016 and compiled a collection of 40,000 objects, creating the nation's largest and most comprehensive cultural destination devoted exclusively to the African-American story and its impact on history. Prior to his work with the Smithsonian's African-American Museum, Bunch was president of the Chicago Historical Society from 2001 to 2005, and at the National Museum of American History from 1989 through 2000. He also served as the curator of history and program manager for the California African American Museum in Los Angeles from 1983 to 1989. Lonnie is also an author of numerous books, most recently, The Acclaimed A Fool's Errand, creating the National Museum of African American History and Culture in the Age of Bush, Obama, and Trump. Secretary Bunch has held numerous teaching positions at universities across the country, including American University, the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, and George Washington University in Washington. I have been privileged to work with Lonnie as a member of the Appropriations Committee, as his friend, and also, Lonnie, let me just tell you how grateful we are that you are with us this evening. Let me welcome you, Lonnie, and thank you so much for joining our lecture tonight. Good evening. Thank you for that kind introduction, Congresswoman Lee, and for all the support you've shown the Smithsonian over the years. And thank you for inviting me to speak with you tonight. I'm thrilled to follow in the footsteps of your tremendous speakers who've been part of this lecture series for many years. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but I'm glad to at least be with you virtually. I'm a historian, so let me begin with a story. During the 1930s, the WPA sent historians around to interview many of the elderly African-Americans who were once enslaved. And one of the persons they interviewed was a man named Cornelius Holmes. He had been enslaved on a rice plantation in South Carolina. And he was asked by the interviewer, now that slavery is over, does it really matter? And he said something that was really powerful. He said, though the slavery question is answered, its impact is not. It's on our highways, it's in our courts, it's in our restaurants, it's in our schools. It's with us all the day, every day. What struck me about that quotation is that really is crucial to understanding the basic assumptions of where we are today as a country. The notions that we should never forget that the impact of slavery, the impact of race, the impact of discrimination will always be with us all the day, every day. But what we can do is ameliorate, but never erase the worst parts of racism. But it seems to me that sets up this provocative question that Dr. King posed as the title of his book, where do we go from here, chaos or, chaos or community? That has never been more urgent than today. As he wrote, one of the great liabilities of history is that too many people fail to remain awake through great periods of social change. But today, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, 
and to face the challenge of change. In some ways, Dr. King was woke before everybody else. But the truth of that has never been made clearer in the age we're in today. The pandemic has revealed so many flawed lines in our country. Given the flaws it's revealed in our political, economic, and social structures, one could be forgiven for thinking that humanity has come down on the side, not of community, but of chaos. Because this is an amazingly strange and difficult moment. It's a moment that reveals the country's racial divide, maybe more clearly than in the last decade. It really tells us about the issue of so many Americans getting their information digitally, and yet the digital divide keeps many African Americans out of this new way of thinking. And also, obviously, the key impact of this virus on African American health reveals the disparities within the healthcare system. And of course, the political discourse we're having or not having really is a discourse that celebrates hate rather than gives hope. But it seems to me, if there is any positive to come out of this moment, I think what it'll do is it'll cause us to reassess many of our institutions, rethink our priorities, and more importantly, redouble our efforts to make the nation much more reflective of its ideas. Or to quote Frederick Douglass, this is a time maybe more than ever that we need to agitate, agitate, agitate. One of the things that drew me to history candidly is that history provides context, clarity, and even some optimism. History teaches us that as daunting as our current predicament is, society has faced equally difficult moments and has risen to face those, risen based on the strength of the African-American community. So for me, history is crucial because it gives us lessons that are useful for today. It helps us to determine where we go and how we go. We are in a really polarized point in our history, but clearly this is the time for us to use that energy to grapple with these racial divisions and voter suppression and red line disparities and the criminal injustice system. This is the moment to do this. I remember so much how I am unfortunately old enough to be somebody that remembers Jim Crow segregation. I think that when I look at back at Jim Crow, I think about how we worried that we could never change a country and we did. For me, it was brought home at a very early age. During the mid 1960s, there was a lot of talk about the centennial of the Civil War. And like many 10 year old kids, I was so excited. And we were going from my home in New Jersey to visit relatives in North Carolina. And I realized that we were passing Richmond, Petersburg, all these places that had museums that talked about the Civil War. And I begged my dad, I said, can you stop? And he always found an excuse. He needed to get gas, let's keep going. On the way back, I begged him again, and again, he wouldn't stop. But instead of driving straight to New Jersey, he pulled into Washington, D.C., and he pulled into the Smithsonian, and he said, here is a place where you can learn history and not be challenged by the color of your skin. And I never forgot how important the Smithsonian was to helping me understand the country's history and ultimately my history. What I realize is that places like the Smithsonian can help put our experiences, what we're experiencing today, into context. They can make history relevant, adding contents to our circumstances and help us better understand the world we're in. So as you could imagine, as a historian, I look back to the lessons of history to point us towards a better future, as models to move ahead. We look back, I look back. I think African-Americans need to look back for guidance, inspiration, and courage. When I think of the lessons of history that are really germane for today, I think the first one is that protest is the highest form of patriotism. So many people, so many African-Americans have historically fought to hold the United States to its stated ideals. People who were motivated by their own inability to enjoy the fullness, the richness of citizenships. I think of Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, people who knew the nation wasn't living up to its promise, 
but they knew to demand that promise meant that you had to not only develop a sense of strategy of where you want to go, but you had to be willing to struggle and willing to sacrifice. I think Frederick Douglass had it right when he said, those who profess to favor freedom and yet appreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground and they want rain without thunder and they want an ocean without the roar of its many waters. He knew something that we should never forget. He knew that it was crucial to protest to hold a nation accountable. He knew that protest is inherently patriotic. Throughout history, there are many who saw injustice and knew that America would not be the more perfect union without action, without people demanding change. They knew that it was wrong for America to say it was the land of the free when there was so much unfree, to say that it was a land of equal opportunity when there was so much discrimination. What we've learned by looking back is how much America has been changed by abolitionists, by suffragettes, by people who were involved in the civil rights movement, who demanded that the country be made better. I think the second lesson of history is that there's an oft repeated phrase, eternal, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. People think that's Thomas Jefferson, but in fact, it's from an abolitionist named Wendell Phillips. For me, what it means, of course, is that there's no linear march to progress and that change is fleeting, fleeting, and that unless you continue to struggle every day to hold a nation accountable, then we see the pendulum switch back in profoundly different ways. I'm struck by example, when I think about how change happens, it is also not just protest, but it's a variety of things that allow people to change. I've been struck, for example, how important it is that African-American culture and the cultural productivity has allowed this country to change. I think of the Harlem Renaissance as probably one of the most important, not just as a cultural entity, but as a political moment. African-American art and music flourished. It inspired generations of artists and intellectuals but more importantly, it created an environment where people began to realize that Black was beautiful, to realize that they could hope for change, that they could dream a world anew. In some ways, I would argue that one of the lessons of history is that there are many tools that help us change a country, and culture is one of the most important tools. You think about the music that came out in the 1960s or rap and hip hop music today, you think about how artists challenged stereotypes, how people who worked in the theater fought hard to develop stories that told a fuller, richer story of the African-American experience. Most importantly, the culture helps us find pride. It helps us find social, social consciousness and social cohesion. In some ways, the cultural community that has historically been in the black community has really inspired us to look for change, inspired us to believe in the sense of community, inspired us to hope and define a world that had not yet existed. I really think that I am struck so much by words of poets like Langston Hughes, who reminded us, oh, let America be America again, the land that has been not never been yet and yet must be the land where every man is free. So for me, culture is one of the most important lessons we learn from history as a tool to move a country forward, as a tool to unite a community, and as a tool that really challenge African-Americans to think beyond what is accepted, to really challenge themselves to be a people that imagines a world, as Langston Hughes said, that has not yet been. I would argue that one of the other important lessons that comes out of history is that how important it is for a country, for African-Americans to help a country confront its difficult past in order to find a better future. In other words, 
to illuminate all the dark corners of the American experience are crucial to helping a country move forward. In many countries, notably South Africa, truth and reconciliation commissions have been tasked with revealing the unvarnished truth, no matter how painful. Several decades after World War II, Germany increasingly acknowledged the legacy of Nazism and the Holocaust, making political and public amends. In the United States, that hasn't happened. You remember when President Clinton was criticized for offering an apology over slavery. In the United States, however, in lieu of a formal political apology, what you have are museums, cultural institutions that use their scholarship, their exhibits, and their programs to address difficult subjects. In some ways, our Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission is the U.S. Holocaust Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of the American Indian, and many others. These institutions, like the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Alabama, these institutions really provide the platform for Americans to discover who they once were in an unvarnished way. And that, to me, is what I think is so important about history. John O. Franklin, the great historian, used to say to me all the time, the most important thing you can do is give people an unvarnished path, past that illuminates all the dark corners, that is painful, but through that pain, there is growth. And through that growth, there's the possibility of change. So in the United States, we still grapple with our inability to embrace our history. We still grapple with the effects of the original sin that I call slavery. And we still grapple from the whole array of issues that stem from that institution. I was struck how much this kind of hatred seeped down to all aspects of African-American life. In my own life, in the 1950s, I was a little kid who loved going to Woolworths in New Jersey. I thought that was the coolest store to go to. And so, once, just before maybe 1959, I was visiting relatives in North Carolina, in Raleigh, and I ran in front of them and I saw a Woolworths. And I thought, oh, wait, I can run in and get a Woolworths hamburger. So I jumped in and sat at the lunch counter, ready to place my order. And suddenly these hands, these white hands picked me up and they actually pushed me into the Jim Crow section where you have to stand up. And I will never forget how much that angered me, how much that hurt. I also realized that from that moment on, I would never be the same. I would be someone who was always vigilant for the kind of discrimination that we'd face, but that I would always find ways to help a country struggle and find fairness. In some ways, that incident back in the 1950s really made me want to study history, really wanted to help me understand the roots and the ongoing legacies of discrimination. And it obviously broke my habit of eating Woolworths hamburgers. But I have to tell you, um, the experiences I've had throughout my career at the National Museum of Af Af African American History and Culture have reinforced how important it is to really confront the past with clear eyes, especially if we're gonna heal our fractured nation. But another lesson that history's taught me is that you cannot make change without loss, without sacrifice. We can look back through history and see unnamed people who suffered from lynching. We see the stories of Amado Diallo um, and Trayvon Martin and all the rays of people to this day that run into problems because they're walking while black. They're jogging while black. They have, the, they have the temerity to smile while black. And that in essence, it is crucial to understand that we cannot affect change without accepting and understanding that there will be loss. For me, that loss is so instructive. One of the most poignant moments um, in the National Museum of, Amer of African American History and Culture was a chance encounter between two visitors standing in front of the casket of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was that young man from Chicago who was brutally destroyed 
brutalized um, and whose mother demanded the world see what they did to her son and whose actions reinvigorated the civil rights movement. Well, standing in front of this exhibit in the museum was a young African-American woman who was overcome with emotion. She shook, she started to cry. She didn't know what to do. And then a white man in his sixties approached her and asked her, I feel such pain, can I cry with you? After a moment, she agreed. They locked arms, tears flowing in silent anguish for the senseless murder of a child decades earlier. For me, that was so powerful because one of the people that has shaped my life was Emma Till's mother, Mamie Till Mobley. I met her when I was president of the Chicago Historical Society. And I'll never forget, she said to me that for 50 years, she had carried the burden of remembering Emmett. And now she wanted to make sure that I and others would carry that burden for her. And I remember the day she sat and talked to me for hours about what happened to her son from the time she kissed him till the time she buried the young man. And I knew at that point, I would make sure that that story would be remembered. And it's remembered in many ways. Obviously, it's about the loss of a young man. But it's also about how a mother, at the worst moment of her life, turned that tragedy into a clarion call for change, into a call that said the world must understand what they did to her son in order to change, in order to stimulate people's involvement in the civil rights movement. Some ways it seems to me that the burden of history, the challenge of history is to take those lessons, not the pain, but to take those lessons and realize that there is great inspiration. And that's what we need. We need inspiration to change. But the other thing that history teaches us is that people have been able to imagine an America that wasn't there. And that's an important thing to kind of demand America be a freer place, be a fairer place. So in some ways, I think what is really crucial that comes out of history is not only do you take inspiration from the past, but that also it's important to realize that all the people who inspire us, some are people who are known, like the fearlessness of Ida B. Wells or the eloquence of Frederick Douglass or the brilliant but contrasting viewpoints of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. I have always been sustained by the energy of history's great thinkers and doers, but I've also been motivated by all the people whose names we don't know, by the enslaved women who got up every day and fed their kids before they went into the field to make sure the field didn't strip them of their hope or their humanity. I marvel at the people like my own grandmother who took in other people's laundry scrubbed other people's floors so that her children and grandchildren wouldn't have to work on bended knee. I marvel at those families that left the South for Oakland, for Chicago, for New York, in search of a better day. In some ways, what history teaches us is that we have the strength to change. And it also teaches us that it is okay, in fact, necessary, to have the kind of debates that have gone on in our community to this very day. Another lesson, it seems to me, is those debates are needed and helpful. Think about it. Many people debated Frederick Douglass. Was it possible to find real freedom in the United States? Or did you have to leave to go back to Africa or the Caribbean? And you can always think about how W. E. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington and later Marcus Garvey debated what is the best way for African-Americans to change their situation? And you can think about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, two different views, but views who had something in common, which was finding ways to force a country to be fair, to address its ills. In some ways, what I would argue is that one of the great strengths of history is that it tells us that debates are not something we should run away from that it's not natural to have these kind of debates within the community. And what those debates do 
is they allow us to understand all the possibilities of change. And only by understanding all the possibilities, only by understanding through strategy and strategic discussions and strong debates, can we envision what is the best way forward. Yet I think that despite all the debates, this country was made better because those views gave us the ways forward. So if we're gonna answer Dr. King's question, where do we go from here? And how to address we can achieve progress, how best we can achieve progress as a society. It's clear to me the past is so important. I think that I'm always touched when I remember that 2020 marks the anniversary of the 15th Amendment, ostensibly giving black men the right to vote. But it's also the anniversary of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. And all of these tell us about patience, about desire for change. Women waited 70 years before the 19th Amendment was passed. The 15th Amendment obviously required Job-like patience. A lit litany of roadblocks were put in place even after the amendment to limit Black ability to vote, whether it's poll taxes or literacy tests. But what's clear is that that foundation was then used by future generations to demand a Voting Rights Act in 1965 and the Civil Rights Act in 1964. In essence, what those acts suggest is that we build on the past to change the present. I've been thinking a lot about the role that youth play and that in some ways it's crucially important for the youth who have led Black Lives Matter and others to push us forward. Don't throw away us baby boomers, but push us forward. And I've been struck by how youth has always been essential to change within the African-American experience. Who can not think about the young men and women who were involved in the sit-in movement? The four young men from North Carolina A&T in Greensboro and their courage to create a notion that sitting in could be transformative. Or those interracial coalitions who rode on, um, who, who rode on the buses together, who were freedom riders, who risked all for the simple decency to be able to sit on the bus where you want to sit and be treated fairly when you, when you got off the bus. For me, as a historian, one of the moments that I've never forgotten was that I was able to, later in my career, help the Smithsonian collect the Greensboro Lunch Counter, the movement of the sit-in movement, the symbol of change. That, to me, tells me a great deal about what a country can do. Who would have thought that young kids, 19, 18, 20, could change a nation? But what they've done is establish a pact on which we now stand, and that now it's key that we can use all of our strength to change this country. I would argue to you, the United States has always been this amazing paradox. There are ideals espoused in our, in our founding documents, liberty, equality, democracy, but yet they're at odds at the treatment of so many people, treatment of the indigenous folks, of African-Americans, of people of foreign descent. But those ideals are really worth striving for. Many of us have died, have sacrificed so much to make those ideals concrete. As someone who cherishes the value of history, I have always believed in the motto of Carter G. Woodson, the amazing historian who created African-American History Month, or was once Negro History Week. He said, the only reason I do history is to make America better. Between the threats of global pandemics and um, political instability, we have our work cut out for us if we're going to be a better country. I see my role as a historian is to help people learn from the past, to help guide them as they grapple with what divides us. And it helps us all to be able to dip into that reservoir of the past and to use that inspiration to push us forward. Because the one thing you will learn from the past is that change is possible. Even when no one believed change was possible, change is possible. But it's only possible by a concerted effort 
that doesn't say we've made it. We've made it to the promised land. If we want fairness in our political system, if we want economic justice, if we want to make sure African Americans don't suffer from environmental racism, we can look back on the past, but recognize we've got to act. We can't sit, we have to act. And it's clear to me that if we are to solve the biggest challenges of our humanity, then if we are to live up to Martin Luther King's challenge by cultivating a community in the midst of chaos, by finding ways to build allies and cross lines to change a country, if we're gonna do that, the lessons of history are urgently needed. History reminds us that progress is not forever. We must guard our liberties over and over and over again. History challenges us to use all the tools we have to do something that African-Americans have done brilliantly, which is we've learned to make a way out of no way, be it by pickets and protest, be it by challenging the legal system, be it by creating new generations of activists through an inclusive and effective educational system, or by gathering support that crosses racial lines through social media. Our goal is the same as the enslaved, to find a freer and fairer America, an America that lives up to its ideals, an America that ensures itself that it will never be the America it says it is and let African-Americans have the fullest taste of that liberty. But to achieve, let me close with these words, to achieve that day of community, of promised land, we must never forget the words of A. Philip Randolph, who said, freedom is never given, it is won. So the battle for freedom, the battle for fairness, the battle for racial justice is on us to this day. And I would suggest that history will help, but we must always realize that we have made a way out of no way in the past, and we continue to do it forward. Thank you very much. We are so very thankful to you, Lonnie, for joining us here tonight and for that call to action. We want to reiterate the very important work you and your team at the Smithsonian do for America. Our American history telling, our truth telling, could not be in better hands. These are unprecedented times. These are unusual and not normal times in which we live. There has perhaps never been a time when the work of knowing where we have come from is so necessary as we set course for where we are going now. We have heard your call to agitate, participate, make connections, and boldly nurture our capacity to sacrifice and to lift up the redemptive strength of turning loss into bold contributions, shaping America. Thank you once again to all of you for joining us here for tonight's lecture. Elihu is coming back just for a minute. And he will be here in just a minute. And we have a special video to share with you in closing as well. Please stay in touch with the Freedom Center for announcements on future lectures. Good night and thank you again. Thank you, Congresswoman Lee. This has been another lecture that has given us a sense of a game plan, a blueprint, for how we can engage our community, our nation, and our world in a program for progressive social change. The Martin Luther King Freedom Center is fighting for that change and fighting to develop the next generation of leadership that will take us from where we are to where we want to go, that will continue to fight to make sure that the dream is no longer deferred. Throughout the state of California, we have young people who are part of the Martin Luther King Freedom Center, learning and beginning to understand the importance of their leadership in the 21st century. We need you to contribute to that effort. We don't all ask you for money, we ask you for an investment in the future of our community. We have much debt to pay, 
from those who gave their lives and their service before us. Now is our time to prepare the next generation of sheep leadership. So I would ask that you would contribute to the Martin Luther King Freedom Center and make sure that you know that you have made that investment in making our world what we want it to be, making sure that the American dream comes true for the next generation of Americans. Hi, the next link you'll see will point you to how you can make that contribution to the Martin Luther King Freedom Center. And after that, we got a special video you're gonna enjoy featuring our very own Congresswoman Barbara Lee uh, demonstrating that she still got the moves. <laughs> Center of the coronavirus, with cases climbing past the ABC reports more than 9,000 healthcare workers have been More than 30 million Americans have filed for unemployment. In just two months, the coronavirus has killed more Americans than the Vietnam War. And during this historic time, we need to love one another. Hey, Tavon, it's your mom. I was just calling to check up on you making sure you're doing okay. I also wanted to remind you, you can only love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. So make sure you're taking care of yourself. Make sure you're protecting your mind. All right, love you. Bye. For my brother. Thank you. 